Uh, Mr. President, since last Wednesday, actually before that, um, I've just been in a quandary, a quagmire of confusion, emotional reactions to what I've observed. And, and it keeps coming. It keeps coming. I keep feeling compelled to say something about it. And every day that we do something here and every day I see something in our nation's capital, something else reinforces and compels me to say a word or two. So I looked up the goals of the Constitution. What does it say? To form a more perfect union. To establish justice. To ensure domestic tranquility. Provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish on and on and on our Constitution. But what we witness requires more than just a comment. And one reason it requires more than just a comment is because it is still with us and it's projected to be with us. It actually was a revelation of sorts. It revealed something that's part and parcel of who we are collectively and what we are. And it's not going to go away by platitudes. It's not going to go away by just declaring accountability. It's not going to go away by just prosecuting some people. All those, all those things must be done, and they should be done. But we clearly witness some very terrible stuff. I just want to relate something here. Let's just consider this. Thousands had swarmed the Capitol. They charged into police and metal barricades outside the building. You know what building I'm talking about. Shoving, shoving, and hitting officers in their way. But Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick. I want to say his name again because, you know, it just seems like he's just somebody out there doing his job. But, if I may, Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick lost his life in defense of democracy in defense of our Constitution, in defense of that symbol of freedom of the greatest experiment ever undertaken in the history of the world. Uh, we call it the United States and it's enshrined in the Constitution. It's the highest law. And among the things that it says in here is to, to ensure domestic tranquility. So shortly after 2 p.m. on the 6th, Capitol Police sent out an alert telling workers in the house office building to head to underground transportation tunnels. Think about that. People just like us, in chambers, in hallways, just like people that defend us now, had to run for their lives in our capital. In our capital. I don't know how that struck you, but I cried. Vice President Pence was taken from the Senate chamber to a secret location. Our Vice President had to be secreted away because of the danger of the situation. The Senate Electoral College debate and a voice was heard over the chambers. They had to cease their work. That's the process of our democracy, all because of a big lie. And we all know it was a big lie. And we know that by the processes that we have, that only, not only reviewed, but repeatedly reviewed through processes. And that's what we do. That's one of the reasons we can sit in here and disagree from one end of the poll to the other 
and slap each other on the back going out the door and say, I'll see you, we'll fight tomorrow. Or perhaps we'll get together on something that we agree on and we'll move that forward. That's the beauty of this. That's the beauty of it. But yet, the arrogance, the intentionality of someone that does not understand or has disregarded what this Constitution means has led to sedition. Have you looked at the federal code? Those acts were seditious. And if you read it, you'll see that the wording fits exactly what took place. Here's why I raise that. Here's why I emphasize that. Because now what we hear in reports is that we're going to see more. There's threats of more. My being quiet about it, you being quiet about it, or anyone else being quiet about it is not going to stop it. In fact, my speaking to it will not stop it. But can we do less? No, we must do more. Because we're defending. We are the bearers of what this Constitution is about, what this country is about, and we're a part of that system. And when people do not believe in that system and they feel that they have the discretion to trans, how should I say this, to trample over the rights of others, even to the point of death, we got a big problem. Next week, Across this nation, with people that are involved, and let me let me tell you, I'm, I bet you, just to hazard something that our president said, maybe some of them are good people. But I give no room to neo Nazis. I give no room to white supremacists. I give no room to those who would transgress because they think their space. It's so precious that they could invade someone else's space that the Constitution guarantees? That is striking right at the heart of who we are and what we are, and it cannot be tolerated. So I look at this situation and I see they're calling for 50 states for people to come outside their state houses and federal buildings and all of this and support what some people call an insurrection. They can use all those words if they want to, but one thing I know happened, it was sedition. I know that, but not only by the federal constitution, but those words are in our code as well. The federal code and our code right here in Kentucky. Sedition cannot be supported. It must be put down. It, heart, it strikes right to the heart of who we are. So this body in Kentucky must speak loudly when they start talking about coming together. If we can't come together around that issue, we can't come together around anything. So what I'm saying is this. When those individuals, and i got to tell you something, I don't agree with everything. The, the president made an expression the other day that he was hurt by what, I probably got the wrong words, by what the UK students did, and he got attacked. Well, I'm standing here to support the president in his expressions, because that's what this country is about. He can express that. And guess what? Those students at UK that gave a knee, they're expressing exactly what this country's about. And if somebody likes it, that's fine. If somebody doesn't like it, that's fine too. <laughs> Express it. That's where we operate. But we don't trample in someone else's space to the extent that we deny them even, in some instances, their life. So, when they do this 50 state thing, and those people, some of them unknowingly, some of them impassioned. I understand protests. I support protests. 
You don't like something, get out there and say something about it. Do something about it. But don't incite to violence. Do not participate in violence. I don't care who you are. I don't care what side of the issue you're on. That's wrong. You know it's wrong. I know it's wrong. And we can debate whether it's the right or the left, and that is not the point. It's wrong. And it should be appropriately dealt with. So here's my bottom piece. When these individuals that come outside this capital with guns don't react with guns. Hey, I got a shotgun. I got a rifle. I got three handguns. I hunt. I do all of that. I don't have an issue with guns personally. But when you bring the guns to this capital because you have a right to does that mean it's wise? Does that mean that you have some purpose that I'm on a, I don't know what that means. So when the governor says, I'm not going to yield to intimidation, I understand that reaction. I'm looking and say, why are they bringing these guns down here? We know, we, we shoot, you can bring a gun up in the, up in the chamber, the upper chambers here, which I don't agree with, but we passed that, so it is what it is. But that's wrong. I'm hoping Two things, and just one other thing, another side, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit down, Miss Mr. President. I don't want to take it too far, but I do want to say this: when I see that battle flag out there, I want you to understand the way you reacted, the way some reacted to what the UK students did. When I see that battle flag, you, just, I just cannot tell you how it starts at the top of my head and goes down to the bottom of my feet, because I know what that battle flag is about. I know what it's about. I know the history. I teach the history. It never even was officially adopted by the Confederacy. <laughs> and I know how it was used. And I know how it's used now. And I know it's a cover. It's a symbol. For racism and all the other stuff that goes behind it. And anybody doesn't understand that. Read your history. Understand what you're representing when you do that. But here's my bottom line. When those people who have a right to protest, which I support and defend, line up with individuals that are denying the processes that have been tried and tested and proven and are central to our nation's viability, central to what we how we regard it in the world, our mission in the world. When they do that, then they're lining up behind those seditious individuals, and they ought to take that into consideration. I cannot equivocate on that. I hope members of this body will not equivocate on that. In fact, I trust they will not. It cannot be tolerated. We can't play it both ways. This is the moment of truth. Not just in Washington, D.C., right here in Kentucky. And we should stand up for what's right. Mr. President, thank you for your tolerance. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Senator from Jefferson 33. Senator from Jefferson 33. Senator from Green. Communicate with the body, Mr. President. Please proceed. Mr. President, the Senator from Jefferson 33 challenges us very appropriately. This is the place for those challenges to happen. This is the place for those words to be spoken. He challenges us to speak to words like sedition and intimidation. Let me preview what I'm going to say to you, and let me speak directly to his challenge. Sedition and intimidation must be spoken against and should not be tolerated. Those words must be spoken against and should be put down. People inciting violence for a cause that's self-serving or a cause that they even believe in their heart of hearts to be true should not be tolerated.
Woven into his words is a question, how did we arrive at this place? And there's also a charge in his challenge of what do we do next. Words without action are hollow and empty. So let's first address this question of how do we arrive at this place? Mr. President, when we shout, when we yell, when we tweet in anger, do we actually think for a moment that we're going to convince someone to change their mind because we're stabbing a finger in their face or drowning them out with a voice that makes them impossible to hear or we're dissing them through some social media platform? Do we actually think we're going to cause someone to pause and say, oh, I'm, I'm changing my mind. New words in our lexicon that fascinate me that speak to this mindset. Clickbait. We've heard the phrase clickbait. We're all chasing that drop the mic moment. Let's say the amazing, fascinating culminating thing that gives me that sense of overpowering you so I can drop the mic and walk out of the room. And then a new one that's in the lexicon that just fascinates me because it sort of sums all of this up. This phrase of cancel culture. Let's through social media cancel one another. In this cancel culture. How do we arrive at this place? There's, no, there's not going to be a single silver bullet solution or an answer that says this is the way we got there. Oh gosh, I wish it were that simple. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be glorious if we could say this is the answer? This changes the world. This bill, this statement, this speech, these words cause a new day to dawn. But it doesn't happen that way. So what do we do about it? What do we do about it? How do we model for the next generation a brighter future? A space for young people to say, I'm excited about what the future holds and I feel confident in this ongoing exercise in self-governing that we refer to as representative democracy. How do we create pride for those that may not have pride in our country? What does the next step look like? And I'm not going to offer to anybody listening, any member of this body, any citizen in the Commonwealth, that what we're doing in the next few moments or over the course of the next 22 days is going to change the world. But let's set a goal and let's chase that goal. And I'm going to put out a place for us to potentially start. A few moments ago, the clerk read into the record Senate Bill 10. And in reading into the record, he said these words, Senate Bill 10, an act relating to the creation of a commission on race and access to opportunity. Senate Bill 10, for those of us that watch the legislative process, falls in that top 10 pieces of legislation, giving it a bit of a priority status. Senate Bill 10, as it was filed on the clerk's desk just a moment ago, carried with it something that I don't think very many of our top 10 Senate bills carry. Mr. President, it was signed on to by the leaders of the majority party and the leaders of the minority party in this chamber. Signed on as co-sponsors prior to filing. Does that make it grander or more glorious or more likely to achieve its path? 
think it carries a greater momentum because of that. But I'm not going to, to, to lie to myself and to the rest of those that may be listening that this is going to be a, a fix-all. We won't remember. The words we say today won't be remembered very long at all. But if these words precipitate some actions that can cause space for change, then we may have an impact that does matter. And I want to share with you briefly what Senate Bill 10, as it's drafted, does. The Commission on Race and Access to Opportunity is hereby established within the legislative department of state government. Within the legislative department of state government, we already have, and they provide a valuable function, within the executive branch, a Human Rights Commission. We don't have in the legislative body an advisory commission to look at legislation, advise us on issues, help us to know the life walk of someone who's not walked a walk similar to mine. This is a very intentional effort to try to create space for more voices. Voices that know a different journey than I know. The purpose of the commission shall be to conduct studies and research on issues where disparities may exist across the sectors of educational equity, health, economic opportunity, and criminal justice in an effort to identify areas of improvement in providing services and opportunities for minority communities. Mr. President, it's going to consist of 13 members. It's going to do this composition of 13 members. The legislation provides for this composition of 13 members in a way I've never seen it done before in this chamber. Equal representation of minority party members and majority party members. This is not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is not a majority or minority question. This is the citizens of the Commonwealth sort of question. It needs, it needs to be approached in that fashion. The Commission shall have the authority to hold monthly meetings, to seek comment, testimony, documents, records, or other information from various government agencies and organizations representing the public in order to address existing barriers to minority success and empowerment. I'm excited about what this opportunity provides us, but I think the need also needs, I think the statements need to also be made about the process that we've gone through to get to this point. And again, I don't, I'm not deceiving myself by thinking this is going to be the ultimate silver bullet. And I'm not saying we're perfect in how we've arrived here, but I think it's important that those listening know that many of us in this commonwealth were moved by what we saw and what we heard and the pain and the suffering experienced in the summer and the fall of 2020. We were moved to have a conversation in our leadership, Mr. President, in August. That then, in a very positive fashion, evolved into a caucus conversation. It was scheduled for an hour. It ran almost two, a little over two hours, at our caucus retreat on these questions. Can we cause someone to change their mind? Through force, intimidation, threat, power. I don't think so. I don't think changing someone's mind works that way. But if we can cause each other to pause and to evaluate and to, to reflect, those moments often precipitate someone changing their own mind. And if through this process we can develop better legislation, create space for more voices, and be influenced in positive ways, we can do something that can last 
and last. And last. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator from Green. Any other members seeking recognition? Senator from Jefferson, 33, I've seen no one other seeking recognition. Return to you for further comment. Motions, petitions, and communications. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first of all, I want to applaud the Senator for Green for his comments and, more importantly, for the legislation that he's put forward. In fact, I'm going to ask his permission to join in as a co-sponsor of that legislation. In fact, I've already written up the paperwork that I would like to ask, uh, move that I be uh, listed, and I see a nod from Senator from Green, and I'd like to submit the proper purpose, uh, papers with respect respect to that. Please file the same without objection. So order. What I like about what the Senator from Green said, which gives me, I was getting ready to say warms my heart. I can't go that far. <laughs> uh, but gives me hope because what he's doing is saying, here's a process that's designed for us to focus in on issues with a lot of voices inputting and bringing them into an official capacity to put them into reality. That's the way I interpret what I just saw. That is welcome, Senator from Green. I want to also say this. I shouldn't say but. My brother used to tell me when somebody says but, they're getting ready to just oppose themselves to you. I'm not going to say but. I'm going to say and. We have an opportunity right here in this session. We already know what the issues are. We already know what our history is. We can do things this session if we do what the Senator from Green was talking about. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic issue. Things that are rooted in our history that I don't even have to get up on the floor and talk about. And it probably grates at somebody's sensibilities. I understand that. Heck, I hear that all the time. I feel that myself. But you know what? As my daddy used to tell me, son, no matter how you feel, try to do the right thing. You got to get above it. You got to get beyond your own emotions. You got to do what's right. When we deal with questions related to race, I know people feel like they being pushed in a corner or somebody's putting a finger at them or they have to reevaluate what they are in relationship to how they've conducted their lives. Well, I do too. But I'm going to tell you something. We should not run away from issues of race. It is right in the heart of part of what divides us. Fairness and justice for all is real if we're going to realize what this experiment is really about. You all don't know me. Members of this body don't know me as a shouter. And you don't know me as an individual that runs around calling people names. You don't know me as an individual that reacts to every insult. And I want to tell you, you may have not noticed it, but I've witnessed many an insult inside and outside of this chamber. And I got to tell you, it's taken a lifetime of evaluation, reevaluation, growth, discipline, and it's an ongoing process for me. I have to tell you, it's personal. But when we deal with this issue of race, and we file these bills which are rooted in history, it might not be the right solution. But I need for you to come on and say, hey, I got some thoughts too. Let's input that. I move around this chamber at will. Everybody knows that. Come on. Come on. It's not hard. It's the right thing to do. So I'm asking you to look at some of this legislation that's going to hit the table. This session, we don't have to put this off. This is not anything real dramatic. And perhaps it's something you have an unreadiness about. 
I'll tell you what. Then why don't we sit down and create among ourselves something to get it where we all feel comfortable about it, but not losing what it's about. We can do that. That's what we do. That's what our job is here. But don't lower the priority of this question of race. I want you to know it is a stain on our history. It is with us now. It's affecting people every day. We all have been socialized in a way that some of us can't even recognize. How we evaluate or why we evaluate our fellow citizen, our human being in the way we do. You know what I'm talking about. So I'm asking, Mr. President, the leadership of this body, I'm asking the members of this body, this session, to grapple with these issues as a high priority. They're on your desk, they're, and some more coming. And let's hear it. And if you don't like it, say you don't like it and vote against it. That's fine. But better, let's get some help here so we can get something that's better than perhaps something put on the table. That's my invitation. I'll leave it right there. God bless you, Senator from Green.